and welcome to The Trumpet, the official podcast of Elephant Room Productions. As always, I am your host, Robert Jean Pelleccio. Uh, I am super excited to share uh, this episode with you. I just want to give everybody a warning. This episode is unhinged in all of the best possible ways. Uh, so this uh, episode, um, we're talking to Riley McCarthy. Uh, they were our playwright for uh, November, um, and they presented us a play called Ivories. We will, as as per the tradition of the last couple episodes, um, I'll be leading with the scene from Ivories and then going into an uninterrupted interview with Riley, which is... A beautiful, chaotic mess. Um, Riley's energy and my energy, first of all, instantly meshed. uh, And you're going to get that right from uh, the jump. But as far as our mindsets uh, are, I recorded this when I was deep into a middle school production uh, directing Beauty and the Beast. So my brain is frazzled from all of that. And... Riley's brain is frazzled from my frazzleness. Um, Also, for those of you who are listening to the episode, uh, please be aware that anytime Riley is on screen for this interview, uh, their dog is in the background. And I could not have asked for a better furry companion guest because as you know from the history of this show, mine are not always on their best behavior. Um, We also uh, switch up kind of the ending of the episode just a little bit. Uh, Rather than our traditional theater question, we actually play a quick little improv game, which falls apart in, once again, all the best ways. Um, I don't want to give away the whole episode in this little intro, so let me just jump into the description of Ivories, set up the scene you're going to be listening for, and then invite you all to sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Riley McCarthy. Brought back to her childhood home to care for her soon-to-be-departing grandmother, riddled with severe dementia, playwright Sloan and her botanist husband Gwyn struggle to settle into a new routine after their lives have been uprooted by tragedy. The longer they stay in the mysterious and bleak New England estate, the more secrets and repressed trauma bubble to the surface. With the arrival of their childhood best friend, Beckham, with a not-so-hidden agenda of his own, The trio soon find themselves spiraling into increasingly sinister discoveries about one another and are propelled into a point of no return. If the basement is the stomach, then what's the basement door? And a description of the scene we will be hearing, the garden. After an eventful evening sorting through the belongings of Sloane's grandmother's estate, Beckham returns to the house to discover his botanist best friend, Gwyn, attempting to resurrect Grandma's dying garden. A conversation of their shared childhood takes a sinister turn as the two discover there may be more than just roots hidden beneath the soil. And with that, please enjoy this scene from our Elephant Ears reading series, Reading of Ivories, and then enjoy my conversation with Riley McCarthy. Act two, scene four. The house turns, 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 rotating all the way backwards. We are now in the garden. There is a mixed array of overgrown or shriveled up plants and weeds. Most of the plants are dead. Gwyn with shears and garden gloves is plucking weeds and trimming out dying plants. After a moment, Beckham enters from the back door with two glasses of iced tea. Why did I just know I'd find you here? Oh, hey. Buy you some tea. Do you ever stop working? Not my fault, Grandma neglected her garden. Look at this mess. Was it neglect or the fact she's dying of dementia? Ah, yeah, there's that, I guess. Sorry, I know you're sensitive about your shrubbery. It isn't even the right soil type for most of these plants. I mean, look at these. So many of them needlessly dead because they couldn't absorb the nutrients correctly at the root. And the frost would have killed them off easily too. 
this is an evergreen kind of climate, you know? I never understand when you're talking about science, but I'm going to nod and say yes. Okay, Mr. Wright. Oh, I'm your Mr. Wright now. Shut up and give me the tea. What kind? Yeah, yeah, whatever, Bex. Gwen takes the iced tea from Beckham. I miss working at Marty's. I really couldn't tell. Are you ever not a smart ass? I'm your smart ass. Are you flirting with me? Your fault for going all straight on me. All three of us aren't straight. Kidding, I don't discriminate. I'm flirt plenty with Sloney. Yeah, yeah, I liked it better when you were drinking tea. You know, when you were quiet. I forgot you're so particular about your gardening time, so I will oblige and zip my lip. It's peaceful out here, what can I say? Gwen goes back to waiting. Beckham observes, taking sips from his tea. I learned so much from Marty. He was like, my everything. He treated me like family, and then he was gone. Do you think he'd still be here today? If... He went out like a trooper, though. Sometimes it's just your time. Name the store had to close, though. Like I said, I missed a really pretty counterboy. Gwen sips his tea. Peppermint. You hate caffeine. You hate peppermint. I compromised. I got all that little mom and pop shot dinner combo thing. I know the one. Good takeout. This town is weird. I can't believe our Sloan is from here. Like everyone here is like weirdly antisocial. Small talk is not a thing. I had to take my ascot off because I feared it was too fashion forward, you know? <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, Sloan and I, I mean, we're managing, you know, but she's been acting, I don't know. Different? That sounds too, no, I don't know. It, it's really stupid. Gwen sets the tea down and goes back to trimming the plants. I think it's because of her grief. I don't want to smother her because Marty, when Marty... I can imagine you don't have to bring it up. You don't have to bring it up if it hurts you. No, I need to learn to talk about it. Moving on, letting go. This is a really stressful time. Yeah, I guess so. I, I don't know. Gwen pulls a dead plant and tosses it aside. As he does so, he unearths some still thriving yellow tulip plants. Hey, would you look at that? What? Yellow tulips. And? These shouldn't even be alive. What, with the state of this place? Fascinating, look at these beauties. Gwen starts snipping them. You find a beautiful plant and then you kill it. On brand. Come here. I just got all comfortable with my perfect view of your yard boy and you want me to move? You'll get a closer view of the yard boy and all his glory if you come over here. Was it not you who just said stop flirting? I'm feeling generous. I see, I see. Beckham heads over to sit next to Gwen, who has trimmed off all the yellow tulips. He stuffs a few into Beckham's shirt pocket. Gonna make me a flower crown? I could if you wanted to. You do make a nice crown. I've seen nicer, perhaps. You look great at junior prom in my flower crown. Don't even lie. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But you were lucky I let you. You were a willing and eager participant. And Sloan looked great in a flower crown at senior prom. Gwen picks up the flowers. Hold out your arm. Beckham holds out his arm. Gwen starts weaving tulips around it. When customers ask for something cheerful, I usually give them yellow flowers because yellow flowers are so sunny and happy. You can't not smile when you see yellow, you know? I usually sprinkle in some pink roses, maybe baby blue forget-me-nots. And they usually give them to friends and such, like a token of appreciation. I like to think they capture the sun's rays, especially when they're in bloom. And everyone likes the sun. Opening up those petals, they're like little beacons of hope. Well, anyways. Gwen has made a beautiful tulip corsage on Beckham's wrist. Hey, would you look at that? Spiffy. Spiffy. 
They look at each other long and hard. They are very unbearably close. They both look like they want to do something, say something. Before they can, though, Gwyn notices one lone flower cast aside. I forgot one. Right. Gwyn twists the flower in his hands. Maybe we should plant the bulb. Will it grow? We won't know if we don't just put it in, you know? Our baby flower, how cute. I guess we have to work out that custody arrangement, agreement. <laughs> uh, Want to help me dig a spot for it, asshole? Didn't really want to get dirty. What if I said pretty please? It's not fair that you take so much advantage of my underlying loyalty to you. You ever think how funny it is that our friendships lasted this long? Like, we were just kids such a long time ago, and like, going on 13 years strong now. Maybe because the botanist has kept the ground fertile, watered, and tended to it. Maybe, or maybe it was just meant to be, you know? Meant to be. Yeah, probably. Gwen starts looking for a space for the flower. Marty's much, well, Marty was much better at finding these kinds of things. I'm seriously shocked the tulips even thrived in this shithole. Everything's dead. When plants die, don't they like repollinate the soil or something? What? Like decomposition or some shit. Oh, uh, I mean, that takes a lot more time than just being a plant lying dead in the ground. Huh? Well, you're the botanist. Found a spot. Hey, uh, can you look for my shovel? Yeah, sure. Peckham wanders off to look for the shovel by Gwen's tools. Hey, Gwen? Yeah? Do you ever think about what if... Gwen kneels by the spot, pulling on his garden gloves and beginning to clear away the weeds and brush. What if what? What if, um... Gwen stops clearing dirt, suddenly tense. What the fuck is this? What? Gwen shakily stands. Th there's... What What the fuck? What? What is it? Gwen points to the ground. Some... Someone buried something here. These are... Beckham starts approaching. Gwen? Gwen? Hey. Bones. Those are bones. Oh my god. Gwen! Shallow bones. These, these are hardly even covered. Easy, 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 easy. Gwen starts to crumple. Beckham immediately wraps an arm underneath him to support him. Okay, Gwen, okay. Breathe. Deep breath. I think having panic. Why are there bones? I can see that. Can you walk? Yeah, can. Gwen takes a step but then fumbles. Beckham catches him and gently leads him away from the plants. He sits them both down. You can do it. Gwen tries to get up again. Beckham makes him stay down. No, 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 no. Deep breaths. <laughs> hey, look at me. Look at me. Gwen sits still, breathing hoarse. Okay, good. Stay there. Beckham starts to get up. I'm going to go get Sloan, okay? Gwen grabs Beckham's hand, hard. No. No, no, don't leave. Gwen starts to cry, deep, heavy sobs. Beckham immediately wraps his arms around him, holding him close in, in a hug as Gwen falls apart. Gwen tucks his head into Beckham's shoulder, squeezing him tight. All right, and that was a scene from Ivories by Riley Elton McCarthy. And without further ado, let's talk with Riley Elton McCarthy. This is the first time I've done this intro where I'm not just starting the podcast and going into it because of starting the episode with the scene. So sorry if that was a little choppy, but hi, Riley. How are you today? Hi, Robert. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm well, as we established for the record, we're both having some days and I think that's actually going to contribute to some amazing energy in this show. We've also got, um, for anybody who's watching the podcast tonight, um, each of us has our own little guests in the background. Um, can you introduce yours, Riley? Yes. Um, Hash Brown, do you want to say hi to the camera? He's looking. Oh, look at him. Hash Brown. It, 
I for those of you who can't it. see at home, it's a puppy. <laughs> uh, my dog passed away in October, and I just got a new one. So, oh, I'm, so sorry. I, I'm okay. But thank you so much. I'm very happy with Hash Brown, and uh, he's kind of the best. And then you have little friends too. I do. the The physical, the the living ones are not here right now. Uh, but people who've watched this podcast before or listened have heard uh, Albus, uh, my big fluffy white cat, and Bellatrix, my uh, rescued from the backyard calico. Um, but I figured since uh, I'm back in the podcast game, we're doing some theater podcasts. I have some theater Funko Pops behind me. So if you're watching, you will see Hamilton and Audrey too, just hanging out. You know, right before um, right before the Omicron shutdown, Broadway 2.0, I was the bartender at the Revival of Little Shop of Horrors. So really? <laughs> at the Revival. Oh, I'm so are you, are you planning, a, like, are they bringing you back for that? Is that show still running? Yes, or? Conrad Ricamora is um, Seymour now. Yes, oh, cool. I, I was during the Jeremy Jordan run. Okay. And that was a crazy time. He, he went off to seize the day. He did, but he also got COVID, as did everybody on that show. So I dealt with the angry, like, uh, Newsies fangirls, like, rushing the bar. Like, did you know he was going to be out tonight? No. Yeah, we put we planned this. We planned this very well. I, uh, well, minimum wage employee, planned for Jeremy Jordan to not be there. I, I mean, that, that has been an issue for me as a director um, for working on uh, a show right now. Um, I'm working on Beauty and the Beast and we started rehearsal at the height of Omicron and it, it's gotten better but like you know without naming names um, I, I had to go like essentially the whole first week of rehearsal without a bell or a LeFou and oh. at one you know oh. LeFou we work around but like Belle shows up a fair amount in this show. So. She's, just like, she's just a supporting character. It's fine. You can find yeah. ways around that. It's really, it's 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 really the Enchantress's story. Um, really. Which actually is kind of what True. I'm doing with it. <laughs> but um, neither here nor there. Uh, I've harumped for about five minutes without actually talking about the person I'm here to talk about. Oh, hi. <laughs> Riley, thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, <laughs> Um, so we just, we're going to hear a little bit about, uh, Ivories in a little bit. We did just listen to a scene. Um, but before we get back to talking about Ivories, uh, would you mind, uh, filling us in on your theater background and however many, uh, theatrical hats that you tend to wear? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. When it comes to my theatrical background, uh, I grew up a military child, so I moved around quite a bit. I spent most of my life in Fayetteville, North Carolina and Leavenworth, Kansas. I kind of got bit by the bug when I went to a performing arts high school in Kansas. Then I moved back to North Carolina and I decided I wanted to be an actor. And I went to Marymount Manhattan College where I got my bachelor's, um, a double major in acting and playwriting. I changed majors like five times, <laughs> specifically changing my double major. I came up as a playwriting major. I decided I only wanted to do acting. Then I tried directing for a while. <laughs> Did not work out for me. I don't like being in charge. Uh, <laughs> and then I went back to playwriting and I think that was the right choice. I, I, I believe it was the right choice. And now I kind of work as an independent producer and playwright and actor sometimes in mostly my own work. I don't I don't really do auditions. I'll write it for myself. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I was in a little bit of a similar boat. I, I double majored. I think I feel like I've talked about this before on the podcast, but um, I was a double major of mass communications and theater and nice. I, you know, I used to it was nice for a bit, but the demands of it just theater was always going to be the priority and you know it was basically one of those things where it's like i love editing i love uh you know film and audio and all that mm -hmm. but i just i hit a wall where i was like i can never see myself sitting in an office editing the weather report for <laughs> this amount of money like yeah. i want to edit things like this podcast or you know i did a goodbye video for my boss last year and I 
you know, Aww. cut that all together and then put them, you know, had the music from WandaVision under it. It was a whole, got a, got a cameo from Michael Rosenbaum at the end. But, um, you know, that's the kind of stuff I love. So I totally see, like, you go in with those aspirations of like, I'm going to do both. And then you very quickly realize <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Uh, directing was not my thing. Uh, I find I'm a very good producer. Uh, I'm very good at bringing people together. And I'm very good at making a team work together. But I'm not, I don't, mm, I, I don't have that director brain. I, yeah. I see the big picture through my writing. And I'm very collaborative with the directors I work with. I bounce off of them in workshops of my own work. Uh, when I am in the rehearsal room, it's a constant like, collaboration for us it's never really us fighting each other in the sense of like <laughs> of like i come in and i'm like it has to look this way i i like to see what directors do with my work in i find that more enlightening than me like being in charge of it and i, I also with both so i don't feel like i can make <laughs> new discoveries as a director in my own work if i were directing it because it would just be my eyes i like to have other eyes right. on it so I, I i don't do that but I have had the enormous privilege of being internationally produced. I was flown to Denmark this summer. Um, I was a contracted artist with International World Pride in Copenhagen. I went and wrote a new play on commission there. My play Southern Bedfellows got its international premiere there. I stepped into the lead role on three days notice while I was there. What? That was really, yeah, that was really scary. I <laughs> I wrote this. I, I have seen, I mean, I, I, I my partner has done a show where due to a like health complication with someone in the cast, the director had to step in uh, for the run. I That I imagine is hard enough. Have, wh rather it be like, I've also worked in shows where playwrights have willingly put themselves in and mm -hmm. it didn't always go well. But like, you know, how, how does that, um, how does that change just, kind of having yeah. all of the words sort of in your head and then having to step into that world. It's actually funny. That play I was very far removed from. I had not seen a production. That was the last show I put up before coronavirus happened, like literally a week before the COVID pandemic hit, went up the in New York. The before times. Yeah, the before times. when. <laughs> well, that was when nobody came to see my work. And now, like, the tank production of Ivories, which we're going to talk about, sold out. We, um, oh, we actually, we ERP did something at the tank a couple years ago in, in the before oh, yeah? times. It was, like, right in the before times, right before. I love uh, the tank. Yeah, it's it was great. They were they were very very lovely to us. Their their team is fabulous. I love Johnny and Megan and Danielle. They're awesome. But we'll we'll get to Ivory's. Yeah. I <laughs> Bedfellows. I have a complicated relationship with. It's my first full length play. I didn't I didn't feel that it was very good. Not the production itself, but I right. didn't feel the script was very good when I first did it. I. I worried because it deals with a transgender couple in the South um, escaping their religion and discovering their identities. I was like, this is going to be really dated in a few years. So a, Nobody so needs a, the story. Yeah. And then so, so a barrel of laughs is what you're saying. Yes, yeah. it was. It was it was complicated for me as a trans person to look at this story and worry that I was like contributing to like a regressive narrative for queer people. Mm. And then I went over to Denmark and I saw the effect it had on people. Specifically, the lead actor had to depart the production very abruptly. I was, I, they were going to pull the show entirely, which like I had made my peace with. I was like, I just won't get to see it. And then I noticed there were no other trans stories in the festival. And I was like, okay, I got to do something. So I offered... <laughs> to take up the mantle and put the play back up. That's and awesome. And it was really terrifying. It's a role that I, it's a much more complicated character than the ones in Ivories. Very unlikable, if done wrong, uh, very selfish male character. And I stepped into it and uh, I remember looking out into the audience during a huge, like, two-page long monologue that my character does, and there was a man in the front row sobbing. And, I, and all through, we had a talk back after two, and this man would not stop crying. And I, 
he was very thoroughly moved that there was a story like this and that I said that there was hope for those characters who go through it in that play. I, I, I think there's a tremendous need for transgender theater and transgender plays by transgender playwrights and the effect that our storytelling can have on people is palpable and ethereal and just so unbelievably necessary right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I'm of the mindset. We, we, we did an episode a couple of years ago about casting against um, race and gender, and then we revisited it with um, casting against race and gender when it comes to voice acting, which mm -hmm. I have a very different perspective on because I think that there is a much wider net that you can cast with, you know, with voice acting. Um, but I, I've been on the other side of the argument for a very long time on whether or not uh, straight actors can play gay characters. Mm. Um, I'm of the mindset that, you know, just in my opinion, I'm in the mindset that they can, but I do feel very protective about trans characters yeah. being portrayed by uh, none. I mean, uh, unless there is a very significant reason for casting it a certain way and it is handled with care yeah, and there are trans voices in the room, I, I just, I believe that playing a character who is a sexuality that differs from your own is different than mm -hmm. playing someone whose gender expression is, you know, is different than, and gender identity is different from your own. So that's something I've always, you know, especially now that the conversations are growing, um, yeah. I'm, you know, and I'm glad that, I'm glad to have a playwright like you that is a part of that conversation because, yeah. you know, I, I certainly agree i want to see more trans stories and more trans voices elevated um i just know that the people who sometimes have the most influence and the most ability uh to reach those audiences are not necessarily the people who they themselves should be i you know i actually um i recently rediscovered my love for the percy jackson series oh, nice. so, Sounds like it's going to be a sounds like it's going to be a wild tangent, but hear me out. Um, yeah. Based on your reaction, I assume you've read them. Yeah, of course, I love. So Percy I, Jackson. so I, I read the main series once years ago, and now I'm going through it again because podcast host Mike Schubert is reading them for the first time and going chapter by chapter and it, just experiencing it for the first time. And there is a there's a really interesting thing that the author of those books, Rick Riordan, does, which is, you know, he's got his Greek myth stories and he's got, I think there's another series that's like Norse and another series that's, yeah. you know, Egyptian gods and stuff. And then he has a whole sub-series called From the World of Rick Riordan, where he will cover culture, like African culture or, you know, Latino, like things like that, all these other different myths but he will outsource the writing of those books mm -hmm. to people of that culture. So he basically has the creative control to make sure it fits within the world of his other series. Yeah. But he, he allows the actual storytelling part of it to come with someone to come from someone huh. that is more versed in that area. So, you know, that that's something I would definitely love to see more of is someone who you know, may not have a trans perspective, may not have a specific, uh, you know, story to tell, but has the platform to tell it and is willing to bring those people into the conversation. Yeah. So before we jump into Ivory's, though, I did want to ask, um, I know you said directing is not, you know, quite yeah. your thing, but it is a hat that you've worn. Um, you definitely rattled off a bunch of different theater hats. So yes, I have. Because, because we're here to talk primarily about you as a playwright today, um, I just want to ask, what uh, of all the hats, what would you consider your main theater identity to be? Playwright. Um, great. That asked and answered. Playwright. Moving on. Um, <laughs> no, but, no, but the other issue <laughs> is, you know, I, I always like to ask, I, I've met people, I've talked to people who are strictly through and through, end of the day, playwright, here's the play, I'm out. So mm -hmm. you have, you've acted, you have directed, whether or not it's quite your forte you do have you have sat in the director's chair before yeah um how have you found these other areas of theater uh especially performance um 
have affected your writing and have, have any plays ever changed shape mid writing just from one of these other theatrical experiences? I love this question. Yes. <laughs> yes. My writing is very influenced by my background as a performer as my background, my PlayStation just made a noise. My background. <laughs> I was watching. Right. The, I was watching a Netflix movie called The House earlier. All right, Ooh. I'll move on. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, yes, my <laughs> tangent, tangent, tangent. ADHD brain, tangent. Me too. Um, <laughs> as we do. Yes, my writing is very influenced by my background as an actor. Specifically, this huge shift happened for me sophomore year when I decided to go back to playwriting because of how I was being treated as an actor at a, at a college. And I really struggled uh, as a non-binary person, as one of the only nine non-binary actors in my program. I experienced extreme micro macro aggressions from professors, from other students, from people who were supposed to be there to support and uplift me. I had a professor tell me that I had to stay in the closet as a trans person because I would never get cast in anything. I was misgendered in pretty much any class, dead named in pretty much any class. I was never given scene work that spoke to me as an actor, which caused me to not have great performances in my acting classes because I was so unmotivated to work on things that I had implicitly told my professors in private that I was not comfortable doing. And I was put into many dangerous and uncomfortable positions also as a disabled person that led to my disability becoming more aggravated to the point that I ended up on a cane for the last two years of my college experience. I have since gone to physical therapy. I'm feeling a lot better, but I had multiple surgeries done. I really, I really went through it in college. It was pretty horrible. And I because am so of that, sorry. I'm okay, but thank you so much. I know, but I just, I, I, I hate hearing that. And I hate, you know, that there, there's something I, I fortunately yeah. never really had to deal with it. Um, I'm also, I'm also a cisgender white guy. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but um, you know, I, I, I have seen it. I've seen it too many times before um, in, classes that I have not been in and did not have the opportunity to speak up and advocate for, but it's yeah. anybody who I, I will say this, I, and this isn't exactly the same thing, yeah. but I have had the, not a lot of students will pass my class professor. And I feel like that's a similar energy to what you're just saying. It's, you know, yeah. just that weird power of like, like Why are you admitting you? you're yeah. a bad teacher? <laughs> like, excuse my language, the fuck? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, the fuck? I just, like, I don't. Like, I went to an elite, renowned acting program, and I had the worst experience of my life, and it informed how I wanted my art to look because I did not want actors to feel like they couldn't work on my playwriting because like the things that mattered to them when they were in acting school, when they were working on the scenes that one day I hope actors will work on, yeah. they did not feel like they were being dismissed by the work they were given. And I really yeah. felt strongly that as a queer person, there were no roles for me in college that spoke to me. Yeah and made me excited to act and wanted to work. And I, like all the things that I had loved and had influenced me, Fun Home, Falsettos, um, gosh, what else did I see? I saw Off-Broadway, Miss You Like Hell. Um, gosh, like um, I saw the revival of Angels in America three times. Is that the one with um, Andrew Garfield? Andrew Garfield, yes. Is there, is there a <laughs> yes. pro shot of that? Cause I've seen clips a round of him performing. Cut this, cut this from the pot, cut this from the, the, the live stream. Um, okay, I hold on, let, let me, let me, let me, let me pop up a, uh, <laughs> I'll pop up my trumpet little logo. Cute, cute. Uh, I have the bootleg, I'll give it to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and we're back from that very, <laughs> no, there was no, I, I had to go, uh, 
Uh, we had to refill our tea. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mine mine is a Lacroix. I have a London fog. It's okay. I, I, yes. By the way, I will say in rehearsal today, I always um, I always love to just make up names for my characters. I'll call Cogsworth Cogsy. I'm calling you know Madame de la Grande Bouche Bouchy. Like I I can't believe I didn't think about this today, but I called Lefou Lacroix for the first time, and. I said it real subtly. I don't think anybody heard me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna slip it in a couple more times. See if uh see if it works. Um. <laughs> anyway, it's been it's been a good 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, we have not talked about Ivory's yet. So now, which by the way is not always um it's not always a bad thing. It is the sign of a really good conversation. That uh, <laughs> I'm glad I, we're having a good conversation. Honestly, I, honestly, it's that's why I, that's why I think I it, I work as a podcaster because I just. You just put a mic in front I'm of me, and fun. I'm I'm fine. It's great. Um, but that being said, um, let's chat about Ivories. So, um, Iver, as I said, Ivories was one of those uh, one of those ear shows that I was not available for the reading. Um, so for me and for all of the listeners slash viewers, uh, can you give a brief description of the piece? Gosh, all right. Ivories is a horror play. Uh, Sloane, a young 23-year-old playwright, is returning to her ailing grandmother's house, both to finish her big first commission with a reputable equity theater, and to sign off the will and handle the estate for when her grandmother inevitably passes. Her husband, Gwyn, is there to help and join her, and something is a little bit off about the house and the neighborhood. Enter their childhood best friend, Beckham, who has his own agenda and his own feelings for one of the two to stir up a little drama. Uh, it's, a, it's a horror play. It is absolutely 100% a horror play. It's terrifying. But it, I would also say it's a romantic drama in disguise. It is a very classic Tennessee Williams romantic drama hidden underneath this terrifying house i'm trying not to spoil any of it if I, <laughs> if I did i think yeah i don't know it'd either make you really excited to see what it looks like on a stage because that house is kooky or you would <laughs> or you would be like mm, i don't one like of the benefits of us um doing these ears recordings via zoom now whereas we used to do them in my house and i was i was there at every one of them because i had the mic uh, but one of the benefits is now they are recorded. And if I am unable to be at a reading, I can not only read the play, I can watch nice. it. So uh, thank you for not spoiling that because I am going <laughs> to check it out. Um, so is this your first? How, what is your general uh, genre? I don't do you kind of bounce around. Great. I gen I gen That's exactly the answer I was hoping for. I, I like to write what I feel in the moment. I have written pretty much every genre under the sun. Like, I just, I like to try new things. I don't know. I don't like to limit myself as a playwright. I think there's so much more I can do. I have one play. Well, Ivory's was my senior thesis at Marymount. Uh, I pitched it as my senior thesis. My playwriting professor was like, this sounds badass. Do it. And then I watched the movie Bohemian Rhapsody. And I absolutely fucking hated it in every single way. So I wrote. Is that the is that the Rami Malek? Uh, oh yeah, where he, where he doesn't sing. Yes, yeah. I <laughs> I can't stand that movie. I was like Freddie Mercury deserves justice. His bisexuality was erased. There was there's a lot of issues in that movie, and I was like, instead, I want to write a movie a, a a play that frees Freddie Mercury. And he was like, I don't know about that. And I was like, I'm <laughs> and I did, and then. Uh, my best friend, one of my best friends, uh, Michael Darby, who was an actor I was in Marymount's She Kills Monsters with, was like, I want to work with you one day. And the big student New Works Festival was coming up. And I had a director I love working with, Hope Johansson, who was also like, I want to work with you one day. And I said, well, why don't I write that horror play uh, I picked? <laughs> I'll make it 30 minutes. We'll just do it like as a one shot, like Zoom reading. Instead, I handed 24 hours later a 120 page script because I was up all night writing it. And I couldn't. I love stop. those. I love those moments. Uh, 
It was magical though, that play, the first read through, we just knew we had something, you know what I mean? Like it's, it was a magical first reading and we knew something special was going to come out of it. And instead, because I was in charge of the New Works Festival, I was also the producer. I was like, cool, we're going to do this as a 10 p.m. like semi-stage Zoom reading. I'm going to draw, I'm an artist as well. I was like, I'm going to hand draw a bunch of pictures to denote the different rooms in the house and different moments, like a dead dog, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> a dead dog. I, and Okay, can I, can I just say that for anyone viewing this podcast, is, that was extra alarming timing because I don't see your guest behind you at the moment. He's okay. Oh, there he is. Okay, he's asleep. He's okay. He's he, okay. He, he dipped he dipped down a little bit and I didn't fully see him. <laughs> yeah, and I'm he, like, excuse me? Hash Brown is like, excuse me, mom, dead dog. No, 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 no. He he good. He good. He good. Strange um, things happen with this play, though. It's a cursed play, which is makes me love it more. But every I mean, you, you did say it's a horror play, so we had multiple people with dying grandmas on the first production, which was oh, really no. really great for a play that revolves around the death of a grandmother. But at what cost? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've warned everyone who wants to produce this play. Like, you're gonna have to take care of your grandmas. Like, <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen with that? So, if you, just based on this, this is a very unique show for us to take because uh, it sounds like it has had some eyes before. Um, yeah. Sometimes, and we and we, it's not our first time we've done that. We've gotten plays that have gone under rewrites, have been. We've got we've gotten plays that have been fully staged and then yep, they just needed to be reworked. So I guess what was the development process like after you initially put it up? And what made you uh what made you seek us out for uh any kind of further revision to the piece? Yeah. So after that initial like Zoom production of Ivories. I immediately kept Zoom workshopping it. My favorite method of the rewrite process, the revision process, is pulling many, many, many actors and hearing each new draft out loud. It doesn't matter if the change is small or large. I will listen to the entire play start to finish multiple times a week, multiple different actors. Drives my friends crazy, but then we end up with a good product, right? <laughs> and... I pitched it to the tank as part of their Pride Fest. It was going to be one of the first live theater events in New York City. And Ivory's, I believe, was the first live full-length play back in New York City without any masks. We did the whole... Yeah, it was sick. I like, remember that week. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. And we sold out every show, and it was a beautiful intimate black box production in this play i re i recall listening to the ears feedback where someone said they weren't sure if this play could be done in a black box i promise you <laughs> it has been done and it was it was it was amazing michael who i wrote the role of beckham for got to play the role and i just i love working with him so much he he killed it same director hope johansson from the zoom stage reading i like to carry my people with me so uh i made sure they got priority on the piece and it was it was stunning and then after that um i really really wanted to submit it to grad schools and to eventually workshop it for the stage there's talks of a copenhagen production right now possible european tour was in the in the in the loop this is Humble a play. Brag. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is that is very very exciting. I am, call me out. Call me out. I have only. Yeah. Hey, listen. I if I if I could have my work produced overseas, I would be. There would be nothing humble about my bragging. <laughs> Oh, I'm just lucky. I have very wonderful collaborators in Copenhagen who I'm really excited to work with. And we all met over the summer and I was like, please, this play. I really believe in this play. It is my favorite play I've ever written. I love all of my plays. They're all my children, but Ivory's, 
is really special. So I what's, came to what's ears. What's hash brown? You okay? Yeah, hash brown is just having a moment. Hi, hash. <laughs> He's like, I want to talk too. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll set we'll set up his interview uh, after special episode. Special, special episode. episode. <laughs> <laughs> the pets of ears. I mean, out. That is actually something that um, I, I don't think we ever ended up doing this, but it's something that uh, Julianne wanted to do was um, to promote the trumpet. She wanted me to compile a uh, uh, if I had the time to do this, I would have. But comb through all the audio and just find recordings that had been ruined by Albus doing something because there have been multiple episodes that, you know, it's just been like so. You know, super serious play. It's like it's inspired by the, you know, the death of my mother or whatever. And it's like, okay, so when you got to give me one sec, Albus, Albus, no, no, stop it, no. And that was when he was. That was when he was a single child. That was before he had a sister that no. he terrorizes. Oh no. Um. But anyway, back. I forgot. Back on. Voice. Back on track. Back on track. This is oh, Ivory's question mark. This is, listen, this is what happens when you put two attention deficit people in the same podcast together. I don't think any sentence I've said has made sense. And that's oh, okay. Tr trust me, it has. It, it all has. I've been following it. Which I'm is scary. Glad. I can't follow my own sentences. But, so, to, so to wind us down on Ivories, um, yes. you've had, you know, you've had this, um, you've got the talks of overseas, which, awesome. Um, but, you know, strictly, um, you know, going off of the feedback of the Elephant Ears reading series, um, yeah. what is your next step for this piece and expanding it and, uh, tightening it up more? Specifically from Ears, which I surprisingly found very helpful. Um, I wasn't... I wasn't sure because I wasn't going to be in the room and that always mm -hmm. makes me nervous as a playwright that I'm like, what do I do? I'm not in the room to hear my <laughs> baby. I like to listen to new people read my baby. I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm crazy playwright. I sit there and I have like my little notebook and I write everything down. I'm, I look like a psychopath, but I, <laughs> I, I was really, really nervous to hear what they would say, but a lot of their notes were ones I had heard throughout most drafts which was that the character sloan uh they weren't so sure about a big twist with her mm -hmm. and i needed to tighten it up and make it more clear and i have since i have since i actually took all the notes from ears and i sat my friends down who have all done this play at some point and i was like what does this note mean how can i translate this how can i fix this and they were like oh riley well that actor's just saying etc 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 and i was like oh my god it clicks now you know, <laughs> I sometimes need help. So I, and that's, I hey, that's, what, that's what we're here for. It, I had my friends translate all the notes and I was like, yes, yes, yes. I see a vision. <laughs> and I fixed it. And that's the draft I sent to grad school. And I got nice. a couple finalist interviews yeah. that I'm, I'm sorting through that I'm really excited about. But I, yeah, the ultimate goal is to go to grad school and then take ivories overseas and hopefully um, somewhere to an equity theater i would like to see a production with the house i <laughs> i really want to <laughs> with the house i'm also i forgot to mention um in the overseas production i will be playing sloan <laughs> I, Put it, I'm so <laughs> this time this time intentionally yes yes <laughs> Uh, you know, I've watched enough people do that play that I don't write many roles for myself. If I, I, I've had role envy. I've watched a couple people do it. And I was like, I could be doing this right now. And my friends were like, why aren't you playing the playwright character? And I was like, I could play the playwright character. So that's where it ended up. <laughs> that's where it ended up. So yes, I will. I've definitely that. worked with playwrights like that before, but it's it's very rarely intentional it's mm -hmm. very much like wow i really identify with this character that i'm writing and then someone has pointed out is that is that you uh oh my but... god everybody asks me what character i am in ivories they're always like are you sloan because she's the playwright or are you beckham because he's in love with his best friend are you gwyn because he's Ooh, a, 
a sad, anxious little little gay guy who loves plants. And I'm like, guess what? All three. I'm like, <laughs> uh, take your pick. Roll the dice. Roll the dice for which Riley you get today. I was like, I don't know. I love those characters, though. I really believe in the story of Ivories and the way it nice. has touched people particularly a memory that stands out specifically the scene that we're using for this podcast, the garden scene, closing night of the show, uh, something really magical happened at the tank and the audience stood and clapped at the oh. end of the garden. It, and this is like the top of act two. Like this scene yeah. is like the open of act two mm -hmm. and the lights went down on Gwyn planting the flower and the audience erupted in cheers and claps. And I was like, oh. And That's totally an amazing left field. Moment. Totally left field. I wasn't expecting it. The director and I like were sitting next to each other in the back row as we did every night to take notes, and we just looked at each other and started crying. <laughs> I'm like an emotional it is... path playwright too. During my own plays, I sit there in the back just smiling and taking notes. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm the same way with the plays I direct. I mean, it's yeah. there's there's no better feeling than crafting the perfect moment and then seeing it just go off just completely without a hitch it's the first time i think i've like actually cried during my work i'm not i'll write these emotionally torturous roles for like actors and i'll have like actors tell me that they cried organically and they loved it and i'll just be sitting there i'm like yeah great congrats <laughs> My friend Michael was like, this is the first time I think I've cried in a play and felt it. And I was like, that's so nice, Michael. <laughs> Good for you, sweetie. That's fantastic. I mean, Thank honestly, you. my sometimes the shows I direct make me cry as well. And I don't know if that says something bad about me, but uh, it's, yeah, I mean, especially, You're I mean, I just. Proud, especially. I, yeah, I mean, I, I had the culmination of one of my life's dreams uh, at the end of the summer, um, directing Little Mermaid. And, um, but my my Little Mermaid um, had a non-binary Eric because the actor Aww. was non-binary and they decided to play the character non-binary. So um, I got to explore that. that. And that really, yeah, I'll, well, we can talk more off mic uh, about that because that, Hell yeah. yeah, that was a huge a huge part of my uh life last year i've been a non-binary scuttle so felt that like actually i think our scuttle our the actress was not non-binary but i believe the scuttle the, the carrot you know her she played scuttle as uh as a they Aww. them and it was yeah we had, had a lot of they them so uh, <laughs> last year i love that so much though queer little mermaid yeah oh it was it was super duper queer like Aww. um all right well Thank you so much for chatting with me about Ivories. Um, and uh, let me let me pop up the. I haven't really come up with music or anything for this yet, but uh, I'll just pop up the logo and hopefully future editing Robert will plop in some kind of like sound. This is a chaotic interview. I'm living for it. I love it. <laughs> this is probably my worst and best interview. Well, guess what? Now I'm just keeping that as the sound. <laughs> um, all right. So um, Honestly, let it make the cut. Let it make the cut. It's making the cut. It's already made the cut. Um, okay. So usually uh, we wrap up with just quick little theater question, you know, a little fun, uh, you know, hey, what about this? Who, who, what musical character you want to have a drink with? Uh, hey, what if, uh, what if uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber was, I don't know, whatever. So um, <laughs> last year, when we relaunched the ears series, um, we did a segment with, um, we had the whole company uh, and I ended it on, instead of just the theater question, I ended it on the theater game and it was provided to us by um, our previous episodes guest, uh, Emily McLean. Uh, she sent a script. Uh, we played a little game of a uh, half for her scene. So I got the idea. Um, this is partially, I want to give credit to uh, Earwolf and the podcast Freedom, uh, who always end their podcast with some kind of little improv game. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to pitch my favorite one to you right now. Um, if you feel like you are up for it, if, here's the thing. Even if you're not up for it, can anything get more chaotic than the conversation that we have just had for the past 36 minutes? 
<laughs> this feels like you and I calling at each other out for like 45 minutes. But in the best lovable way. And now Hash Brown is like coughing in a corner. I'm like, oh no, Hash Brown. Hash, you good? Again, I'm saying that Ears Pet podcast. We're doing it. We're doing it after this. Hash we're, Brown we're... volunteers. Chris, if you are listening to this episode, which I hope you are, uh, I have a new project for us. Um, anyway, so this game, this is uh, this is one of my favorite um, theater games. Uh, I got it from this other podcast. It's called Switch It, Then Pitch It. Mm -hmm. um, the premise is one of us is going to be playing a TV executive. The other is pitching a brand new sitcom. Oh, God. <laughs> the gestation of the sitcom is uh, player... Whoever is the exec is going to give the other person a real TV show title. Then that person needs to pitch the verbal opposite. So if the, if the show was home improvement, you would have to pitch a show called Workplace Destruction. Mm. Uh, so I leave it to you. Is this the type of... Uh, game that your brain can handle this time of night we can try it i don't think you're gonna get very good results all right but would you like to be interview would you like is to... already questionable so I... <laughs> would you like to be would you like to be the executive or the pitcher give me the pitcher i guess throw me all right phone. wow i was not <laughs> expecting that <laughs> i was giving i was giving you an easy out but all right <laughs> your show is hold on hold on wait i've got a bottle of wine great open it up one second i've got Lacroix. <laughs> your show Bet. um the good place the good place so all you need to do is pitch to me a show uh you can even go so far as to cast it uh pitch a show where the title of the show is going to be whatever the opposite of the good place is. Hold on, though. The good yeah. place is actually about the bad place. So how do I do an opposite of the good place when the good place is oh, the bad God, place? Oh, God, you're right. You're right. Okay. Okay. I, I accept that. Um, sure and I'm gonna, I'll am give you an, I'll give you another show. Um, Legends of Tomorrow. What? You what don't need that? to know anything. You need to know anything about the original show. All you need to know is the title is Legends of Tomorrow. Flip all those words around in your head and you'll pitch me a show. Okay, cool. Hey, so Riley, thank you so much for uh, for coming in today. Um, you are the last. I see you've brought your dog to the pitch meeting. Yes. Whatever. Actually, he goes with me everywhere, so. I don't know what kind of game you're playing, but you are almost at the finish line, my friend. I have never had a pitcher bring in a dog before. All right, well, I'm a very busy man-like person, and I've gotten a lot of good TV show pitches today. So whatever show you... I don't know where this voice is coming. Uh, whatever show you're going to give me, you got to make it sparkle, and you got to uh, blow me out of my chair. I'll blow you out of your chair with some pizzazz here because I've got a story called The Pitch of Today. This the is Pitch a of Today. Yeah. Ooh. This is about a dog. See, see, I can't, the camera's flipped. It's a visual Either. aid. That's why you brought the dog in. <laughs> now the accent has changed. I'm not drunk enough for that. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you see, that, was my, that was my brother. Shut up. All right. The pitch of today. Okay, the pitch of today. Got it? All right, we've got the dog who is, I can't, with the camera flipped. We've got the dog who is trying to pitch a show to a TV executive whose accent keeps changing, you see. Um, specifically, uh. this dog is actually supposed to represent me and because I'm a very anxious person. And the dog actually has ADHD. And he's trying to write a show called The Legends of Tomorrow. But the legends of tomorrow aren't very relevant to him because he's a dog and he has very short attention span, you see? So he's not really, like, able to think beyond his present. So a lot of his emotional journey and his emotional arc is trying to understand. 
<laughs> how to think ahead of time. And uh, there's a lot of calendars and a lot of wine, like this lovely grapefruit rosé that I bought for $5. Well, you've listed three of my four favorite things. Calendars, dogs, and wine. <laughs> Am I sold? Well, I, I, I just need a little bit more. So I have two questions for you. One. Shoot, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, I will. Uh, <laughs> number one. What's the emotional stakes for this dog? Why is he doing the, the things that he does? Is there a love interest or interests to be had? Well, you see, the dog is coming back from a European tour of his play. <laughs> and uh, he kind of fell in love with his co-star there. I keep moving because the camera is reversed. He kind of fell in love with his co-star. <laughs> Hash Brown, you're killing it, man. Thank you so much. Visual aid. He really kind of fell in love with his Vi co-star. Visual aid to anybody who's listening to this episode. <laughs> like... <laughs> he this is the most chaotic interview ever. Um, back to improv game. <laughs> if he fell in love with his co-star, fell in love with his co-star, can't afford a flight back to middle megalovania, Transylvania, wherever the hell it is, um, and needs to buy a plane ticket so that they can go be with the love of their life because they're non-binary now. Non-binary now. Mm. I, I thought you was talking about multiple dogs there for a moment, but it's still oh, no. just the one. Oh no, just the one. He, they, thank you. <laughs> All right. You, you are quite welcome. You the are dog, quite welcome. The dog is in love with his co-star, needs a ticket, can't afford a ticket. He's trying to sell the show, but can't remember past today to make plans to do so. So it's really a race against time for this dog to remember in the next 24 hours what the hell he's doing every single day and it keeps resetting. So really, it's kind of like Groundhog Day for this dog. You know this what I mean? This dog. This dog, because every morning he wakes up and he forgets what he was doing because he's just hungry. Like... <laughs> so I have, two more, two more I have two more questions and then I think this pitch will be pitched. Great. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> because we have him under contract for whatever network this is. Bet. Would you consider bringing Steve Carell on as the voice of the dog? No, I would not because Despicable Me is an atrocity to man. I would not consider Steve Carell, but I will raise you Bill Hader just because I love Barry. I think okay. Bill Hader could do a that. good job. Yeah. Well, that, that throws a monkey wrench into my second question. Oh, no. Which was going to be, can we cast Bill Hader as the love interest? But mm. how Bill would you Hader feel about, as long as it's not a voice acting role, how would you feel about Steve Carell as the love interest? Is Steve Carell trying to buy my pitch? Like, wh how? why is this man trying to weasel into the, the pitch of today? Like, I just want to know, hold, like, counter question. Hold on. Hold on a second. Hold on. Get him on they're the on, phone. They're, they're on to us, Steve. Quick, get out the back door. Okay. Get him on the so, phone. Here's my here's my decision. Yeah. This pitch seems to be exactly what we are looking for to fill the 705 to 720 slot. We're a very odd network. <laughs> and all intents and purposes, uh, this should be a win. But I'm going to pass on this pitch today. Mm. Um but please, because of the nature of the business, do not be surprised if a uh, almost photo uh, exact duplicate copy of this show hits the airwaves next season with zero credit to you. I hope you understand. I'm used to getting ripped off, so it's fine. <laughs> and scene. Um, this has been amazing, and I cannot imagine a... Uh, I cannot imagine this interview going any better or worse if I if either of us had had more sleep and less rehearsal. So, um, Tell me about it. I think that we lean into the chaos and we we just we go with it. So, Riley, thank you so 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 much for sharing Ivory's with us, and thank you for coming on and playing with me for about an hour um, as we kind of match energies 
Honestly, this was kind of fun, Robert. So thank you for having me. <laughs> but only kinda. Always leave me wanting to improve. Honestly, we could have a return episode with Hash Brown where it's just improv games. <laughs> Damn it, we're we're doing it. I'm down. <laughs> All right. Thank you so, so much, Ryan. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Trumpet, the official podcast of Elephant Room Productions. The Trumpet is hosted and edited by me, Robert Jean Pelleccio. The views and opinions shared by the podcast guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Elephant Room Productions. For more information on Elephant Room Productions or on the Elephant Ears reading series, please visit us at elephantroomproductions.com. Until next time, this is Robert Jean Pelleccio, signing off.